So if you're just joining us uh, now, my name is Joanna Wedge. I am the Alliance's co-lead of the CPMS Working Group. Um, and I was asked to moderate this session, which was a real pleasure. If I'd been, you know, asked which of these sessions today, uh, you know, in the in the overall conference, would you like to moderate? This definitely would have been one of them, because it's an issue that's very close to my heart and part of our alliance strategy that is so so very important for us to uh, to make a move on over the coming years. Um, so before um, we go a little bit further, I wanted to tell you about the 90 minutes that we're going to be spending together right now and the flow that we have. Um, we've tried to bring together, as I said, a very interesting panel um, and trying to ensure that there's a multitude of perspectives on how to operationalize this concept that uh, many of us have in our organizations or many of us have in our hearts about putting children at the center of humanitarian action and making sure that their protection is, is um, front and foremost. So what we will um, see is we'll have three presentations from country-based colleagues really spanning the globe. We have one coming from Colombia, one from Nigeria, one from Pakistan, and we'll be learning uh, about um, their operations and, and how they've been able um, to put children at the center of their work. Um, then we're going to hear from the Global Child Protection AOR about um, how cross-cutting elements have been addressed in HNOs and in HRPs. And we'll have a small panel, we'll have a presentation, and then a small panel of a couple of speakers. Um, throughout the 90 minutes, we have some time for questions. So please, um, if you feel brave and want to put up your hand, we'll be able to um, uh, you know, listen to you and, and, and get your mic on. Uh, otherwise, feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll be going through them um, to look and see um, what questions have arisen. Uh, and once again, the same thing for our colleagues who are joining on YouTube. So I think that's the, the bulk of, of the introduction. I wanted to, before I introduce our first speaker, actually do a small poll with you about um, centrality of children and their protection. So if we can have uh, our first little uh, question up. It's uh, for our country level colleagues asking, does your humanitarian program, so if you're a country in a country operation and you work in humanitarian setting, we're asking if there is a specific focus on the centrality of protection in your current programming. I don't see the quiz up on screen. Can one of the producers clarify for me? Yes, uh, Johanna, the poll has been launched. There we go. We do have some participating at the moment. Perfect. I'm not getting a visual cue, so I'm uh, lost on it. All right, we have about 17% uh, that have inputted, 25. It's picking up slowly. We're almost Lovely. at about 40%. Yeah, uh, 45, nearing 50% contributions. Excellent. Well, let's stop that poll there. And if you could share with us the response to who has who in humanitarian programming at the country level has a specific focus on centrality of protection. Results have been shared. Joanna, can you see? I can't see anything. I'm not sure why. I don't know if others can. <laughs> can you read them out to us, Natalie? All right, so we have uh, the first poll question for country level colleagues, about 73% uh, answered yes, 27% answered no. Okay. Uh, and for question two, uh, about the participation in a meeting or training, we had 65% answer yes and 35% answered no. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for feeding it back and thank you everybody who responded. Um, really high numbers and 73% of you say that yes, it is there. So you probably have some experience in grappling with the operationalization of this concept. Um, and then about two thirds of you have had some kind of briefing or training. Um, so interesting to hear in the chat box or, or later in the question time, what that might have looked like. So with no further ado, let's learn from some of the people who are doing just this. 
Um, we, I am going to introduce now our first speaker, who is Amy Smith. She is working with Save the Children in Colombia as the Senior Technical Advisor on Child Protection. And then she will, after her presentation, introduce her colleague, Anthony Nwanzi. Over to you, Amy. Hi, Joanna. Thanks so much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our participants. Thanks so much for joining. As Joanna said, my name is Amy Smith, and I'm going to give a brief overview more from the country office experience of how we've implemented centrality of protection here in Colombia with Save the Children and some of the learnings and recommendations that we have. So to kickstart, I think the key thing for me is to give a bit of context maybe about where we are in Colombia. I guess it's not often visualized. Uh, just to production, how do I go to my next slide? Thanks so much. So I just want to give a quick overview of uh, Colombia before we get started on looking at centrality of protection. So here in Colombia, we as Save the Children have a very multi-sectoral intervention covering not just child protection, but also education and emergencies, child maternal health, water sanitation, hygiene, cash, food security and livelihoods and child rights governance. We tend to be focused mainly on the Venezuelan border, which is towards the north. So looking at the map here, you'll see La Guajira up into Arauca, where we're attending mainly migrant and refugee populations. And then if we go down south, we're looking at largely at the coast Pacific. This is one of the most conflict affected areas in Colombia. Despite the signing of the peace accords in 2016, here in Colombia, we are still seeing affectations of conflict. So it's very important in terms of centrality and protection, looking at identification, monitoring and reporting of grave rights violations. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I think one of the key things, just to give you some context of how we're operating centrality of protection, here in Colombia, we are seeing increased needs amongst conflict affected and mixed migrant and refugee populations. We've had the affectation of the Venezuelan refugee and migration crisis. More recently, we are seeing mixed migratory movements going up to the Darien Gap, which is on the Panama border, as we see more and more populations trying to make their way up to the United States and conflict affected populations, particularly Afro-Colombian and indigenous populations. To give you some context, since 2021, we've seen an 11.5% increase in the number of children affected by armed conflict here in Colombia. According to Qualico, which is a Colombian coalition to prevent the use of children in conflict, more than 268,000 children newly affected by conflict last year. And in terms of grave rights violation, in 2022, we saw 284 verified grave rights violations by the MRM. That's up by 47 percent since 2019. We're seeing more individuals forcibly confined. This is basically where children and their families are restricted in their movements. Armed actors, non-state armed actors essentially do not permit them to leave their communities. This obviously affects access and restriction to basic services. And a key thing to flag is, I'm sure for many other country contexts as well, this is one of the most underfunded humanitarian crises. 90.4% underfund for the current response plan according to the financial tracking service in OCHA. So I just want to give that kind of overview of this is where we're operating and how we're operating in Colombia. So in terms of the centrality of protection, what are we doing? So I think the key thing, as maybe other country colleagues will know, the key thing is you really need to build centrality of protection training and awareness as part of your mandatory training. One of the key things we felt when we first implemented is that often centrality of protection is seen as a child protection or protection sector responsibility, when actually, as we know, this is a responsibility for all staff and all members of the team, whether they're from cash, whether they're from logistics, whether they're from finance. So one of the first things we did was make sure that all staff and volunteers have mandatory induction on centrality of protection and that we carry out refresher training. So we've done this mandatory centrality of protection training now. We largely focus on identification and reporting of grave rights violations and other serious violations, recognising that in our context this is a very key part of centrality of protection for us. 
Last year, we trained 106 new starters, and we continue to do this on a monthly basis. This was basically a conversation with human resources and ourselves to make sure that we are part of mandatory training. Another key thing, and I think this is very important, is, as I'm sure you're all aware, you really need to get buy-in from your field staff and your field managers. One of the most uh, successful lessons we had is establishing focal points at the field level who have a role to negotiate and coordinate with field managers to make sure that there is implementation of centrality of protection. In our case, our focal points are case management coordinators. That is largely due to the fact that we feel not only are they able to do the reporting, but also to make sure that on our side, if there is informed consent of the child and caregiver, that we can also then complement our action with direct case management support to provide orientation to the affected family, depending on the services uh, that they need. Also as well, we have an internal reporting tool. I think this has been very important to make sure that we have confidential and safe reporting channels for identification and reporting of grave rights violation. We base this off the MRM recommendations and forms that we operate here in Colombia. So this was done in conversation with the MRM special task force. And this also ensures that we are able to quickly send any kind of identification of grave rights violation to the MRM focal points here in Colombia. Our focal point here in Colombia is UNICEF. Another thing I think is important to say, we see big opportunity this year. Last year, the new Colombian administration signed the Safe Schools Declaration and Save the Children is a co-lead of the Education Emergency Cluster here in Colombia. One of the key things that we've been pushing in the cluster is looking at how can we do cluster-led monitoring and reporting of education-related violations, trying to make sure that we're getting that buy-in at the cluster level to ensure better coordination between all emergency and education actors and making sure that we have that implementation. I also just want to draw attention to the left of the screen. Uh, this photo that you see is basically a, a totem. <laughs> so it's essentially a very large uh, poster that we have at all field offices with a QR code, which helps individuals to understand who are their focal points at the field level for grave rights violation reporting and monitoring, and to better understand our centrality of, of protection policy. We found that this kind of visibility and communication in field offices is really important to really make sure that you're integrating and implementing this policy and making it part of what we do. In terms of next steps, one of the things we're doing here in Colombia as part of our localization strategy is looking to train some of our child protection and wider protection partners in centrality of protection and also working across sectors to see how can we better design child protection risk matrices to ensure that protection mainstreaming across the sectors. So one of the things we've been doing within the child protection subgroup is looking at how maybe we can coordinate with the CASH working group to see that we can create these child protection matrices as a guidance for others when they're doing their implementation of programming. I'm just gonna finally stop with some recommendations. <laughs> I think for any country offices or organizations looking to do centrality of protection, one of our biggest recommendations is really understand and communicate with your MRM task force. I think the most key thing for us is that Save the Children Colombia is in constant communication with Qualico, the Coalition Against Involvement of Children and Young People in the Colombian Armed Conflict, with the UN Refugee Agency and UNICEF who form part of that MRM task force. It's really important for us because I think, you know, grave rights violation, there are six, but we recognize there is a much wider plethora of other serious rights violations that can happen to children, areas of concern. And it's really important to maintain that response and communication with your MRM focal point to maybe flag areas of concern that don't necessarily sit as a grave rights violation, but they are still a considerate serious rights violation that maybe you would want to flag and let them be aware of. This kind of leads into my next point. There needs to be wider recognition of other serious rights violations. I don't think Colombia is the only country that has a very complex and volatile conflict dynamic where we see other rights violations such as forced confinement, forced disappearance, 
trafficking, torture of children that maybe don't necessarily sit within the realms of the six grave rights violation and how best as a kind of wider child protection and protection community, we can elevate and do advocacy to visibilize these other serious rights violations that sometimes can lead to grave rights violations. And finally, community reporting. Uh, unfortunately, in the South American region, Colombia has one of the highest rates of assassination of community and social rights and human rights activists. This makes community reporting very difficult and risky. Uh, so I still think we need a wider conversation about how we guarantee safe and confidential channels for communities if they wish to report, as we do see that that can sometimes be a barrier to kind of ensuring that we can really scale and understand the wider uh, dimension of how many grave rights violations are taking place. That's all from Colombia. Now I'd like to pass over to my colleague from Nigeria, Anthony Duanzi, to give a bit of a conversation around what we're doing in Nigeria. So over to you, Anthony. Thank you very much, Ami, for that great and wonderful presentation. Um, I'll be building on what you've said to just um, show um, what we're doing here in Nigeria. And um, most of my presentation will be pictures that I'll be speaking to. If you look at the first picture that looks at how we operationalize um, centrality of protection in Nigeria, these are the girl champion. And uh, we're, we're doing this, showing the possibility of looking at protecting, looking at centrality of protection from the child protection, from, from, the, from building the child protection systems. So across the Northern state, these are the girls champion and the girl champions, are, are, they are recognized, the child parliament, children's parliament are recognized by law. So the girls champion work with um, the parliament to ensure that the rights of children are protected. We use them as um, they, they, they carry out advocacy activity to ensure that uh, children gives the opportunity, they, they have the opportunity to attend schools and to them, when the girl child stays in school, then that can elongate the and eliminate early child marriage. So these are um, girls champion from five states in Nigeria. And this picture was taken during the launch of the state of the Nigerian girl child in 2021. Um, the next slide, please. So basically how, how do we, when it comes to centrality of protection in Nigeria, what do we do? We, we ensure that uh, most of our design, most of our projects is built on the fact that community must have capacity to identify and report um, grave violations against children rights. So in most of our designs, in all our, our projects in Nigeria, we ensure that we build the capacity of the community. The communities are on the driver's seat to also understand, to have the, have the capacity to not only report, but also um, to understand the early system, early warning system around the community. That's a possibility there's going to be an attack or this has happened. So for us, we build the capacity of the community to actually have the knowledge, understanding, and the possibility to report grave violation. Secondly, we also strengthen the child protection system. Like I said, we are, we are looking at it from the child protection point of view. We are ensuring that the legal framework, we work with the legal framework to improve the protection architecture, knowing quite well for, for children to be protected, for children to have justice, then there is a need for us to have a legal framework that protects the rights of children at all times. And um, the third strategy is we are not doing this alone. I must acknowledge and appreciate the joint efforts of the, um, of, of the CPAOR in the Northeast of Nigeria, Child Protection Area of Responsibility. We are working with, in collaboration with the interagency to ensure that all these are uh, actually um, achieved. So I'll be making my presentation on these three key pillars. Thank you, the next slide. So basically, if you look at this, like I said earlier on, community capacity. 
in all our design, all our projects, we ensure that the communities are the driver's seats. We ensure that they have the knowledge, skills, and also avenue to report any grave, any grave right violation. Also, we ensure that we have equal representation of the different groups, whether they are women, children, ensure that we have the voices of children in the committee, in the community-based child protection committee. If you look from the right, you see a sample of how the, 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 the child protection committee looks like. You have women, you have girls, you have youth. And building the capacity of this group is very central to us to ensure that they recognize those things that would, they recognize and they have the channel to report grave right violation against children in the community. So the idea is that the community design a plan for the year, they understand, they have knowledge on the grave right, on, on, the, on the right of the children. And when those rights are breached, they have the channel to actually communicate their concern. And this is linked to a system to save the children and also to the reporting system in, in the Northeast. The, the next slide, please. So if you look at this, the legal framework is also very important when it comes to protecting the right of the children. And if you are looking, especially if you are looking at it from the, um, from the child protection system point of view, without the law, then the, the, the law needs to be there as a starting point. In Nigeria, for example, the Child Protection Act was uh, signed to law in 2003. And almost two decades after, northeastern part of Nigeria, where we currently have the humanitarian crisis, none of those states have actually signed the, 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 the child right bill into law. So what we did in collaboration with the, the, the CPA or the intelligence, is for Save the Children and the Intelligence to bring the house of the, 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 the lawmakers in Borno State. If you look at the pictures, these are the pictures of the lawmakers. We actually, with the support of um, some members of the group, I must acknowledge the, the work of UNICEF, PLAN, TDH, British Council, IRC. We actually brought the lawmakers from Borno State to Abuja, the capital city, to actually um, reflect on the need for the law and the need for the lawmaker to ensure that 20 years after Nigeria signed the Child Rights Act, there is a law protecting children in the state. And I want to tell you this, after this meeting, this was a successful meeting that led to the passage of the law. So Save the Children co-sponsored the Bono State House of Assembly members and the commissioners of um, Women Affairs and Social Development to have a final review of the Child Protection Bill in preparation for the public hearing. On, the, on my right side is the Commissioner for Women Affairs and um, uh, um, addressing the House of a State House of Assembly. And these are the Honorable Members of the State House of Assembly and um, the Honorable Speaker reflecting on the need to pass the Child Protection Law in the state. The next slide. So basically, this is the executive governor can say in 2020, in 2022, the law was finally passed and signed into law. And this is a legal framework. And this has pro provided protection architecture for children in the states. These have actually provided a framework for the uh, the children's parliament to hear the voice of children to push for issues that affect children in the humanitarian crisis. So, uh, in 2022, the, the the governor signed this into law, and as part of the provision of the law is to have the child right implementation committee. This was um, formed. The the child right implementation has been formed, and uh, save the children is part. Save the children security agencies, government agency, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Men Affairs are in this committee. Last week, there was a training in Abuja for the child rights implementation to ensure that the provisions of the law is actually implemented and respected, to ensure that we engage the different 
system to ensure we have a whole lot of funding to protect children in the state. This is the, the next slide. Also, apart, apart from this, knowing quite well that when it comes to issues affecting children, well, when it comes to children in conflict, attack in school is also what, what, what it is. Attacks in school is one of the major incidents. If you have heard in the news what has happened in Nigeria, especially the adoption of the Chibo girls. So we also need to set up systems to prevent attack in school. Nigeria have actually signed the national policy on safety, security, and violence free from um, violence free schools. How do we bring these policies into practice? How do we ensure that this moves from the document to the day to day running to prevent schools in Northeast Nigeria from attack? What we have done with the support, Save the Children, is also a co lead in the education and emergency group. So what we have done is to support with the help of the EIE working group is to ensure that we help in developing a minimum standard for safe schools. So when we say safe schools, what do we mean? What are those things that needs to be in place for us to say a school is actually safe? For us to ensure that this document, this policy moves from being um, uh, from, from, from commitment, yes, it's commitment from government to say, yes, we have signed the safe school declaration, but from commitment to practice, what do we need to do? So what we have done is to ensure that there's a minimum standard for every school to meet to ensure that children are actually safe. Also, Save the Children also ensures that as part of the um, safe school declaration, we developed a manual to engage all military um, officers, all recruitment in the Nigerian, Ni Nigerian military to pass through this, this manual as part of the mandatory training in protecting children from school. That simply means the way they manage ammunitions around children, the way they occupy the, 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 the occupations of school. So what we did is to invest and uh, with the support of the Nigerian government, they are able to adopt this uh, manual to ensure that all military officers are trained on safe school declaration. Not only that, financing is also very important. Financing is very key. We have also worked with partners to ensure there is, there is a national plan on financing because these are, these are the way to make to, from, from, from documentation to bring to life the need to protect children, especially in humanitarian context. And what we have done also is to ensure that we support the national plan on um, safe school uh, financing. So the, the, these are the critical work that has gone into being to ensure that it's, the document moves from government commitment to the day-to-day -day implementation and practice on ground. Um, I will be rounding up with my la last slide to say we are not doing this alone. We are not doing this alone. I must appreciate the work of the Child Protection Area of Responsibility. Uh, Save the Children is a strategic is a strategic advisory group member in the, in, in Borno State, and we co-lead in Borno Adamawa. So we must acknowledge the fact that these successes and this feat was achieved in collaboration with the um, with the Area of Responsibility. Save the Children is also a member of the Reintegration Technical Working Group. And the reintegration technical working group are those specifically working to support children formerly associated with armed group. And we are also leading case conferencing for complex cases in the Northeast. With all this, we've been able to ensure that there is, we, we looked at uh, protecting children from the child protection point of view, from child protection, strengthening the system knowing quite well that even though in an humanitarian setting, humanitarian context, there is a need to ensure that sustainable systems are in place to protect children. And these are some of the things that we have done in Nigeria to ensure that children are protected during humanitarian conflicts. I don't know if we have any questions, we'll be on ground to take those questions. Thank you Fantastic. Thank you so much for your presentation, Anthony. And then before you, Amy, 
I mean, I'm just, lots of questions are coming up and trying to field them and lots of thoughts around, you know, as you raise the importance of both of you, the importance of community, uh, clarity and engagement and, and discussion. And um, the point you raised, Anthony, around funding, this doesn't come for nothing. There needs to be, um, you know, a system in place in order to better protect children. Um, and then you talk, both of you, in, in, about the legal framework um, that needs to be strengthened and implemented. Sometimes it's there and it's just not implemented in a consistent way. Um, there were a few questions um, that I've noted down. Um, I don't know if I can get to them quickly enough. Um, one of them, uh, Amy, I think it was for you, was around the nexus and working with kind of wider human rights community. Um, do you, you, spoke, you mentioned a little bit about that. Could you tell us a bit more about how you've been able to tap into that or, or why you've chosen not to go too far in that, uh, that route? Yeah, so I think on the nexus, I would say, firstly, Colombia to me, though we are attending a humanitarian response, this is one of the world's most longest running armed conflicts. So it's a protracted crisis. For me, it really is nexus <laughs> that we're operating in. I think in terms of human rights actors, uh, at the kind of community level, we have done some very light touch awareness around a uh, grave rights reporting and grave rights identification and like the channels that exist and international mechanisms that exist. But like I said in the presentation, it's something that cannot be done lightly. It takes a lot of kind of conversation starting very general at a child rights level. We don't directly mention recruitment and use. We don't directly mention sexual violence. We come from a general rights-based perspective before we get to those much more minute details of how to do reporting. I think as well, one of the things we've also been doing at this step is looking at women's and other human rights associations that are interested in child protection issues and are keen to establish their own reporting that is linked to the MRM. So I do think there is space to do it, but I think it's a very long-term process because like I say, the type of organizations that we were working with are living in conflict affected areas where non-state armed groups are present. So it's not an easy journey. And I think it's something that you have to do from a very general <laughs> rights perspective before you get into the very kind of core part of uh, yeah. violations, if yeah. that makes sense. Thanks. Anthony, I don't know if you want to add on to that or I can take another question. Let's, let's, let's I take the next question. I think she Okay, has, uh, let's see some other questions that are here. I'll, I'll put a yeah. couple to you, to you both and, and see what you want to pick up on. Um, so this question from Anna about, um, Wondering uh, how colleagues support the understanding of the difference between the centrality of protection and protection mainstreaming. Um, where do you go with that? Um, and then let's see if one of the last one's a question or not. I've got a new one. No, just lots of applause and thanks for uh, the work that both of you have shared. I think if I can start, um, when it comes to protection mainstreaming, um, protection mainstreaming is for everyone, whether you are in uh, protection, whether education in humanitarian response, you must take into being that uh, you must mainstream the principles of protection. You must ensure that you do no harm in your activity. You must ensure participation of children. You must ensure that the communities are aware of your project. Uh, you must ensure that the communities are aware of what you are doing. So basically, when we talk about uh, protection mainstreaming, it's just ensuring that the principles uh, of protection is, is adhered to not only in protection project, but also across projects. But when it also comes to um, um, centrality of protection, that simply means that, especially in, in conflict situation, that simply means we must put the interest of children. Something is, is they have similar characteristics, but they, they have a point of convergence and they also have a point of um, departure. For example, in centrality of protection, you must ensure that for us in Save the Children, we are looking at it from the child protection system. And that's why we are saying, no, beyond the principles, we are saying, what are the laws saying? What are, do we really have a national strategy? How are we, how are we working from the reintegration technical point of view, how are we building our capacity within with other actors to ensure that the needs of these children 
are protected. So it goes beyond principles to the day-to-day -day practice. And I must say, for example, in Nigeria, you can you can look at the northern Nigeria to a place like Afghanistan, where the voices of girls, uh, where girls are not allowed. But if you look at the young girls I showed in my first picture, these are girls champion. These are girls that are, that are pushing for girls' education. These are children being at the center of pushing for change. These are girls that have been acknowledged by the government and the, and the system to say, no, we need to invest more for girls because these girls have represented their states both in local and international, in international events. And this has actually called the attention of the state government. They have given some of them scholarship. The state government have set up scholarship for girls. And these girls now in centrality of protection, they are now saying children must be protected and the system must invest that the right of the child is actually adhered to. I don't know if I may want to add to this. Thanks, Anthony. I think I would just speak more to the, the humanitarian coordination system. For me, the main difference is protection, like centrality of protection is more than protection mainstreaming, you know? It's where you have the leadership and the coordination, especially from your humanitarian coordination team to say, the protection of peoples isn't just an issue that is for the protection cluster this is for everyone and making sure that the very highest levels of your humanitarian coordination in the country the way you're working that it is embedded into the coordination of what everyone is doing so i give the example of how we've been working with the ed emergency and um, education emergency cluster because to me that is them um, recognizing the importance of centrality of protection recognizing the role that the education emergency cluster can play in identifying education related violations and ensuring that it is embedded in the day to day of what they're doing as a coordination platform. So I think I would really stress that because I think for me that leadership and coordination is to me what separates centrality of protection from protection mainstreaming, you know, mainstreaming everyone can do in their programming, we can provide matrices, we can provide guidance, but actually you need that humanitarian coordination team buy-in to ensure that from your humanitarian response plan, there is clear actions of how we are embedding centrality of protection across the entire response. Thanks. Fabulous, thank you both. We're gonna wrap the questions for now and go on to another colleague who is going to be presenting and comes at this um, in a, different perspective with MHPSS as an entry point for talking and centering children and their protection. So we have another um, Zoom poll for you, which is asking you, do you have experience in mainstreaming MHPSS so far? So if we could launch the Zoom poll, I'm not going to hold my breath and think I'm going to see it for some reason. <laughs> yes, we have launched the poll, Jana. So far, we've got over 20% contributions. Uh, we're slowly nearing about 45 and a few more. Uh, we've just hit this over just a quick yes, no. All right. 55%. Shall I close the poll? Let's just wait one more moment. Um, and uh, if you've already uh, answered the poll, you want to pop in any questions, um, please do so. Again, for anyone following us on YouTube, please put a question in the chat box. We are monitoring it there. And yes, let's hear back. Who has experienced mainstreaming MHPSS? All right, well, we have uh, about 48% here saying yes, they have, and 52% saying no, they have not. Okay, so about half and half. Yes. All right, well, with no further ado, we're gonna learn, I'll learn a little bit more. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to present our colleague Zara Haq, who is again a technical advisor um, with Save the Children in Pakistan. Over to you, Zara. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joanna. Uh, You've gone on mute. There you go, Zara. Uh, sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to present what is importance of centrality of protection through integrated program and look forward to your thoughts as well. Next. Uh, Pakistan ranked on the second worst uh, country according to the global gender index. Uh, there is multiple uh, uh, reason 
uh, reason to sustain gender in, uh, inequalities like weak implementation of the laws, policies, uh, gender-based discriminations, and structure inequalities. These structure inequalities uh, also put negative impact on the lives of the children, especially adolescent girls and children with disabilities. Uh, next. Uh, recent floods have had negative impact on the lives of all genders, especially children are, and other vulnerable uh, groups, as 33 million people are in the need, and out of them, 60 million are children. This is an awful uh, situation because uh, that depicts uh, the serious violation of the child rights due to inadequate uh, facilities, displacement, infra uh, inadequate infrastructure, and loss of the livelihood of the elders and parents. Uh, that's why we see a, a lot of child rights violations like as discrimination, SGBV, uh, neglect, abuse. Uh, next. Uh, here you can see Save the Children International uh, strategic focus as we are a child focus organization and we ensure centrality of protection in our humanitarian response. Next. Uh, well, protection, in my perspective, protection is a life-saving intervention, but it is not often, uh, but uh, is not often not uh, prioritized in early humanitarian intervention. Uh, PFA is a good entry point to save the life and address the need and concern of the children, especially who are at risk. Psychological first aid is a good example to reach more caregivers and parents to create insight into how to identify the sign and symptom of psychosocial distress and respond to them accordingly. Uh, here, uh, I'm going to share a brief example of um, uh, Safety Children Pakistan emergency response. Um, uh, psychological first aid and safe identification referral trained a staff member were embedded into uh, distribution other sectoral team and we provided early uh, psychosocial intervention uh, in uh, in the uh, evacuation center delivery uh, points and within the uh, temporary uh, learning center as they were established uh, uh, within these uh, child friendly spaces uh, some uh, child friendly spaces were established uh, separate to provide uh, a psychosocial support to the children. Uh, in addition, implementation uh, partner staff are trained on child protection, mainstreaming, safe identification and referral, psychoeducation, psychological first aid and psychosocial support component that was effective to improve their knowledge and ultimately contribute to the quality of the uh, program. Um, here I can share one example integrated uh, response uh, as in the health and proje uh, nutrition project uh, project intervention psychosocial support and PFA was provided to uh, the two, 255 children in the mobile camp and health facilities. Meanwhile, uh, integrated case management referral uh, mechanism was established that was very effective to address the need of all genders, especially children, children with disabilities and adolescent girls. Save the Children Health Mobile Team organized health screening camp adjacent to the child-friendly spaces that are located in the target areas of KP and Sindh. Uh, province of Pakistan, where our target response were continue at the early emergency phase. Initial health screening of children uh, was completed and children who have some uh, general health problem that were referred to further health services. Uh, this referral mechanism was very effective to ensure the safety and protection of the children because we have two type of the referral me mechanism one within the safety children, another a safe identification referral through ser uh, other service provider. Uh, next. Uh, here you can see the glimpse of our intervention that created positive impact uh, on the life of the children. Um, yes, next. Uh, here, um, I will more emphasize early action at preparedness level should be incorporated, uh, like as a core team should be trained or uh, uh, trained in psychological first aid that can quickly deploy and respond to the need and concern of the affective children, especially children, adolescent girls, and children with disabilities. 
um, this is a key takeaway and lesson learned from the uh, um, humanitarian response. Uh, next, I uh, I will share one major idea and that is take uh, key takeaway from all of you. Uh, um, I, um, uh, we can reach more children early in uh, early in response through integrated programming uh, because it will reduce the mitigation and uh, mitigating and preventing child protection issues increase with early mainstreaming and integration. Um, thank you so much. If you have any question, uh, let me know. Perfect. Thank you, Zara, for your preparations and, and for that presentation. Um, I'm not sure if we have some more questions in the box so far. As I said, feel free to raise up your hand. Um, I, uh, I do have one question for you, which is um, the I, I've been quite interested in in the training of the health workers and um, making them more aware of um, you know children protection issues and and mental health and and so on. And I was wondering if you were able to take that training beyond Save the Children to other agencies. Were you able to engage at all with the cluster? Could you talk a little bit about the ripple effect of of your training? Uh, 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 yes, uh, we uh, uh, we have the core team that were trained uh, on uh, psychological first aid, and second, yes, um, uh, we have uh, six core sectors uh, where we uh, incorporated uh, psychological first aid. Uh, yes, um, uh, uh, it will be a good initiative uh, if uh, we further uh, replicate. Uh, uh, to the members of the clusters, uh, that will be more uh, effective because uh, uh, psychological first aid is an entry point to save the life and address the needs of concern of the uh, children. But we need to prepare the core team that should be trained on PFA at the time of emergency. Uh, uh, they can be deployed and uh, contribute to save the life of the children. Excellent, thank you. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. I don't know if any other presenters uh, want to raise anything that they see as a connection. Otherwise, we will have one last time for questions after our next set of speakers. Try and see if there's any hands up as well, because I did encourage people to put up your hands. I don't see. No. One last message. Let's see if it's a question. No, it's a thanks. Uh, Zara, Amy, Anthony, please do take a moment to look at the chat box comments because there are lots of uh, praise and, and interest in, in what you're saying and some connections um, to other pieces of work going on uh, in other countries and other um, humanitarian settings. All right, well, we'll now move on to our second grouping of presenters. Um, I think many of you will know the first speaker. Um, Ron Powells is the global coordinator of the Child Protection AOR, um, and he is going to do a little introduction and then bring on some members um, of his team. We have, um, let's see, Pamela Marie Godet is a gender-based specialist, um, a gender-based violence in emergency specialist, sorry, with, uh, with UNICEF and contributing to the AOR. Uh, we have Dennis Kyoko. Uh, who have had the pleasure to meet through through this uh, initiative, through this session. He's a localization specialist um, that is um, attached to the global CPOR, and then also joining from uh, one of the operations um, of Afghanistan. We have the co-lead uh, of the Child Protection AOR there, who is Martin Odiambo with Save the Children. So over to you, Ron, for your introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. And thanks to the previous speakers. Very interesting to, to hear from, uh, from you and your work in the, at the country level. Um, so my session, uh, the session that we'll, we'll follow now is about placing children and their protection at the center through integration of cross-cutting issues in the uh, HNOs and HRPs. Um, but before um, giving my introduction, we'll do a little poll uh, first. And we will be looking at, uh, at the question of what best describes how cross-cutting elements are addressed in your context. And we have a couple of 
answers that you can choose from. So please go ahead. You should be seeing it now and the link in the chat. Okay. We have 45% respondents. Please continue to put in your choices. We'll give it a few more seconds. Be great if we could at least reach 50 percent we're at 47 at the moment perfect we're at 50. so um we see here that 52 percent of you says that some of the cross cutting elements are addressed 29 percent says sometimes addressed uh 14 percent uh, are addressed but not all the time and five percent say that they are rarely addressed. So thank you for, uh, for your feedback on, uh, on the question. Um, so in, in 2022, so last year, the Global Cluster Coordination Section within UNICEF, uh, which includes all the clusters that UNICEF leads or co-leads and the, and the CPAOR, engaged the consultant to, to conduct a comprehensive review on how gender-based violence, disability, accountability to affected populations, child participation, and child safeguarding and PSEA are reflected in the 2022 humanitarian needs overview and in the humanitarian response plans. What to test one or five criteria for reviewing the integration of these cross-cutting issues for a coherent and joined up approach to identify common challenges and enabling factors that support integration of these important issues and most of all, policy commitments. Let me share with you two key findings. The first one is that we need to avoid lumping together groups in both analysis of needs and in response planning women in all their diversity and children in their intersecting identities and forms of marginalization need to be referred to a separate Hello, Ron, can you hear us? All right, we've just lost Ron. Are you or? Yeah. Sorry, Janet, we seem to have lost Ron for a second there. Sorry, where I realized I was disconnected. Where did I? To what did I part did I get? You were still wrapping up on the first point, I believe. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, just um, a repeat of the first point. Uh, we I said that uh, women in all their diversity and children in their intersecting identities and forms of marginalization need to be referred to as separate categories to distinguish their specific risks, their needs, capacities, and priorities. And then secondly. We found uh, that with some countries sharing with us that there was a lack of awareness on the benefit of having an integrated We lost you again, Ron. There seems to be some connectivity issue, doesn't it? 
John, we'll wait for a few seconds. If not, we can proceed to the open dialogue. We share. Yeah, then Ron, the then Ron could feedback some more. Seems to have gone black. All right. Why don't we do that, Pam? Why don't you take on, take yes. over, and then he can always contribute a bit more in the session. All right. So as Ron was trying to emphasize, um, there is a clear recognition of the importance of integrating cross-cutting concerns from child safeguarding, child participation, localization, AAP, in this case, accountability to children, including gender-based violence risk mitigation and disability inclusion into the coordination of humanitarian action. However, we see that there are remaining challenges in realizing this in practice, especially in the context of many competing priorities uh, at the field level. We know that relevant policies from the IAAC Interagency Standing Committee, including checklists and tools have been released over the years, and uh, they have raised the awareness about the collective responsibility to address these policy commitments and cross-cutting concerns. However, the, the influx of resources and guidance had the unintended consequence of creating a, a sense of overwhelm and fatigue among humanitarian actors and field coordination teams that in effect hinder the effective and efficient um, integration of these cross-cutting concerns as an intrinsic part of humanitarian response design and delivery from the outset. So we see the, that some cross-cutting concerns are often overlooked or relegated to the sidelines or periphery of the humanitarian response. Or we see also that pick and choose approach. So from the field, we would hear that for this particular year, we will just do gender mainstreaming, or this year we will just do disability inclusion because they're overwhelmed with how to go about it. But on the other hand, we want to make the case that when we integrate cross-cutting concerns effectively into the humanitarian programming cycle, it helps to achieve that goal of placing children and their protection at the, at the center. So as um, Joanna mentioned earlier, we have two panelists, Martin from the Save the Children, who's co-leading the Afghanistan Child Protection Area of Responsibility. And we also have Dennis, the localization specialist from the global CPAOR. As we go through the dialogue, I would also like to invite our other participants to, to reflect on the guide questions that I will pose to Martin and Dennis, because um, we do have a depth and range of expertise here uh, participating in the annual meeting so that we can uh, have that exchange of learning and uh, expertise. So the first question, um, as Ron mentioned from our cross-cutting review, we found that the tendency for women and children to be lumped together as a homogeneous or monolithic category or group. So this means that we are not able to distinguish their specific capacities, needs, risks, and priorities. And this relates to one of the challenges we often hear from field colleagues that there is not enough reliable data on the needs and priorities of the most marginalized. For instance, child and adolescent survivors of child marriage or boys and girls with disabilities. Even prior to a emergency context. And we know that collecting this data becomes even more challenging in an acute phase of an, of an emergency. So for Martin specifically, what are some of the ways uh, that you have done to be able to unpack the differential impact of a particular crisis on children in all their diversity? So thank you so much, Pamela. As already mentioned, my name is Martin. I work with Save the Children in uh, Afghanistan. So it is true that in most cases, especially in uh, new emergencies, it is not easy for partners uh, to get the kind of data that is required for us to have that level of analysis to identify the key protection needs that are affecting children. And therefore, the case is similar in Afghanistan. 
So in order for us to identify the strategies that uh, we have been able to use, one of them is whenever uh, we are going to do the HNO, HNO is humanitarian needs overview. Uh, since the whole of Afghanistan assessment is uh, one of those that uh, you know, meets the criteria we've described above, monolithic, we have to go back to the uh, Excel sheets where the raw data is. So we always have to ask for this raw data, identify questions and variables that will help us provide a little bit more granular details to uh, aspects of child protection in our context in uh, Afghanistan. And then by providing that granularity, it is possible to then become so specific on the needs of different segments of children's population and propose the kind of responses that would work. Then secondly is on data triangulation. So what do I mean by data triangulation? Normally, we have a number of uh, assessments being conducted by various partners. And therefore, in so specific areas that uh, we feel there are uh, a lot of uh, data gaps, lacuna on that extent, it is critical that we then have to review these uh, documents and then come up and generate uh, information that will help us to fill in the gaps that we already have so that it is then from this that the needs that uh, we have the priorities are going to be identified and therefore have an effective response based on the various diversity. Uh, a number of agencies are doing things like uh, uh, consulting children, consulting adolescents. There was a good research on that conducted by Save the Children that was able to fill in the gaps, given that the HNO, the whole of Afghanistan assessment report doesn't get into this kind of details that will help us identify this level of uh, info. Then just the last one for this is protection monitoring. You know, uh, we also identified that the protection monitoring tool had a lot of gaps, especially on identifying the kind of protection risks that are there and in a context where we have access constraints, constraints, it is not possible for us to reach a number of population. At the same time, uh, the segment of population that is women and girls is almost impossible to reach them whenever you're doing all of Afghanistan assessment. And therefore the only way to do it is protection monitoring through our activities. And by doing so, we are able to identify these areas that would be able to provide us that level of info required. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, for that raw data, uh, I think it's quite time consuming and heavy lift. So ideally the collective assessment through the whole of Afghanistan in this case should be able to generate the gaps and needs with mm -hmm. that level of granula granularity or disaggregation. But unfortunately it's not happening. So you're doing that very heavy lifting and time consuming going through all the raw data. Um, thank you for pointing out the data triangulation. And I think across uh, context, we see that if coordination teams are able to uh, put together qualitative data with quantitative data, then they do get that more nuanced picture of protection risk, um, especially for um, boys and girls and adolescents. Um, moving on to the second question, um, we found that while some of the humanitarian needs overview would have a solid intersectional analysis of the differential impact of the crisis to boys and girls, adolescents, youth, um, this is not often translated to the humanitarian response plan. So when we put side by side the humanitarian needs overview with the humanitarian response plan for that particular country, we don't see the matching. So solid HNO needs analysis, intersectional analysis, but the HRP is missing in terms of coming up with the appropriate and concrete protection risk uh, mitigation measures to be able to address what have been identified at the HNO level. So 
what are some of the ways that you have done to strengthen that coordination so that when you have articulated the protection risk at the level of needs analysis that they're adequately addressed at the same time on the humanitarian response plan? Yes. So basically, from what uh, we've been able to do and uh, dwell on is on having an inclusive data collection where there is a multi-sectoral data collection being conducted, reaching out to different segments of the population. Uh, other than just gender, age, and diversity, we also want to look at the uh, population types uh, the ones that are in the urban, rural communities, so that we understand the different contexts that they have. However, you know, in the HNO, it will provide this info, but it doesn't get into the details that will help you come up with a, a targeted response plan that will support in the response, uh, in the response when you're coming to implementation. So, in order to do that, we are currently doing efforts, making efforts uh, to ensure that there is a participation and representation of these uh, marginalized groups that are already practicing or uh, in various contexts so that we can be able to have that, uh, uh, the level of connection between the HNO and the HRP. Because in most cases, they don't really speak to each other because of the uh, details that are there in the HNO, which doesn't give the level of info that will help in uh, HRP. Secondly, is on intersectional analysis. So whenever we're doing that, the findings of the intersection analysis, especially uh, I talked about the protection monitoring tool uh, that are being conducted during the HNO should be integrated into the HRP. So if, depending on the various uh, questions that have been asked in the uh, tools being used as data sources for HNO, we want to look at what are the kind of the intersectional analysis we can derive from this data in order to come up with that level of details that will help us in coming up with the response plan. So the HRP therefore should actually explicitly address the different impacts, the differential impacts of the crisis uh, on various groups, including the adolescent girls, and especially speaking at this point where there is restriction on female participation in almost all activities and uh, the deprioritization of protection it becomes so challenging. And therefore you have to constantly come up with the uh, contingency plans that will going to reflect the context as it constantly changes. Then finally, I'll talk about collaboration and uh, coordination. So there's need for that level of strong coordination mechanisms using the cluster approach. Mm -hmm. And in this cluster approach, working with different uh, stakeholders, including the UN, uh, national NGOs, local authorities, including the community-based child protection mechanisms. In Afghanistan, we also call them CPAN, Child Protection Action Networks. So these are the kind of uh, uh, structures that are quite essential in order for us to foster that level of uh, connection for us to identify the kind of details required in the formulation of the HRP. Again, we'll have to work with this expertise in various fields when we are doing the severity scale in order to identify how do we uh, and solicit for expert judgment in trying to identify these uh, locations, identifying what are the parameters we're going to use to identify the protection risk for a particular area. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. And thank you for mentioning the importance of working with the marginalized groups themselves and the local national actors. And this transitions well to our next question, which I like Dennis to answer first, because he's our lead, global lead for localization. So 
we found that the one of the most important factors to having this inclusive uh, rights-based uh, approach in our humanitarian programming is to be able to engage local and national women-led organizations, organizations of persons with disabilities, and other representative groups participating and at the same time leading the needs assessment and response planning. So then it's based on the technical support that you have been providing to our field cluster coordination teams. What have you seen uh, that are most effective strategies for promoting the, the participation and leadership of our local and national actors? Yeah, many, <coughs> can you hear me? Thank you. M many thanks, uh, Pamela, and also to the uh, colleagues who, who had just presented uh, previously, who also focus a bit on uh, some of the works uh, that uh, they are doing on localization. And just to acknowledge that the piece of work that we have been working together with the countries, uh, you know, we've, it has been a concerted effort. Uh, shout out to the different uh, colleagues who are here that we are working together to entrench localization policies and practices and working with both local and national actors particularly uh you know with uh with the focus on a uh, women-led organization and also other um you know uh other man marginalized uh, groups some of the things that some of the um, initiatives activities and uh, you know innovations that we've seen uh that are happening uh in the diff uh, in the different uh, clusters are ranging from short term to medium term to long term uh, initiatives that we've seen we've seen simple uh you know uh aspect that uh, you know uh for instance clusters that are having uh interpretation uh, you know uh interpretation services clusters that also are having their meetings on local on local uh, languages and this has really increased the participation of uh, local and national actors uh we've also seen uh, you know um in different other countries and also uh, clusters, uh, the in terms of uh, increasing uh, leadership of local and national actors, we've seen uh, scenarios of uh, promoting co-coordination, uh, you know, from uh, co-coordination with the national and local uh, actors, uh, whether at national level or whether at um, whether at uh, sub-national level, and this is really in line with the uh, with the recent ICE guidance on. Uh, increasing participation, representation, and leadership of local and national actors in ISC uh, structures. We have also, uh, you know, uh, been engaging and uh, seeing that there are some clusters that are even engaging their local and national actors in SAG, uh, their strategic advisory groups. Uh, even at the SAG level, we've seen uh, in, in some clusters that are promoting a co-chair chairmanship of the of these respective SAGs, which I think that's a good uh, it's a it's a best uh, uh, practice. Uh, and uh, with regard to promoting uh, you know quality funding uh, to these local and national actors, we've uh, seen uh, scenarios where uh, different clusters are advocating for uh, local and national actors to receive direct funding, uh, humanitarian funding, or even other uh, you know from other donors. Um, and also we've um, we've also you know uh, when we have been engaging with uh, 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 with uh, we've witnessed some scenarios where there is a move towards not only strengthening the technical capacity but also the institutional capacities of these uh, you know local and national actors, particularly women-led organization, uh, organizations of persons with disabilities, and also other marginalized uh, uh, groups. Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. I'm seeing a time reminder. But last question for Martin, um, especially in the context of Afghanistan, as, as you know, the, the situation there. Um, can you just quickly cite some of your multi-sectoral collaboration that you're doing with Education Cluster, for instance, to be able to put on the table child protection? Yes. So uh, in Afghanistan, of course, we are at a point where integration is one of the key uh, topics that we need to always constantly refer to because of the kind of restrictions I already talked about earlier. So at the moment, we only have education and health that are uh, implementing activities. And therefore, one of the strategies we are using is to promote integrated programming where child protection 
some key light activities are identified to be implemented within an education and health uh, sector activities. And we've been able to come up with what we call operational adaptation framework. And this operational adaptation framework identifies the uh, various aspects of child protection that can be adapted by uh, education and health in order to promote the output for children in their various activities. At the same time, we want to look at, uh, we've been able to see donors also promoting this integration, including ECHO, who have or, uh, categorically stated that all education projects must be able to have some protection, child protection activities. Secondly, is the interagency coordination. You know, working within the interagency or intercluster coordination team, ICCT, uh, which is basically a collaborative uh, body that fosters uh, cluster leads and cluster colleagues, including NGOs, it is therefore a mechanism that is used and uh, led by UN OCHA that strengthens coordination to ensure a holistic approach to address the needs of children and protection, hence the centrality of protection. The various aspects of uh, clusters that come to this uh, sitting have various activities that they are doing and we promote the level of engagement we can have with them. And then finally, I'll talk about sharing information and data. So in data sharing, there are some level of commonalities that we basically look at. And these uh, commonalities include in information sharing protocol. Uh, GBV, uh, child protection have the same. And therefore, we want to come up with a situation where the uh, data that is being, uh, information sharing is actually developed in a way that it's possible to ensure partners understand the confidentiality aspects and therefore help to promote uh, confidentiality in the implementation of the previous programs. Over to you. Thank you, Martin. I, I have some follow-up more questions, but we are running out of time. So we just know that multi-sectoral collaboration is mm. key and we really need that to be able to address the cross-cutting uh, protection needs and intersecting protection needs of children in, their, in all their diversity. I now hand over to Dennis to summarize with our infographic. Many thanks, uh, Pamela um, and colleagues. And uh, just to sum this up is that uh, uh, even from the, from the research that we did, um, uh, we were able to identify that, uh, you know, we can place children and their protection uh, through addressing the cross-cutting elements and how we can be able to address these cross-cutting elements in the HNO and HRP is looking at it from, uh, you know, these four, uh, these four uh, 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 quadrants or dimension, looking at, uh, you know, localization, uh, how are we able to work with local and national actors uh, to identify their, uh, you know, to identify their capacity needs in the, uh, in the HNO, and also, you know, uh, identify their the role that they will play in the HRP, and also, you know, their funding gaps, uh, including also uh, being very intentional on not only strengthening their technical capacity. Seems like Dennis is breaking up a bit. So they are. Institutional capacity. Uh, with the regard to data, we found out that uh, you know it's important for us to be able to disaggregate. Can you hear me? Yeah, you, you were a bit, you were a bit broken up. But keep uh, going, sorry. Dennis. Can you hear me? Uh, can you Go hear on, me? Dennis. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Um, Looks like we've had to cut Dennis's connection. The connectivity was very broken. Pam, can you summarize the rest of the slide or? 
Yes. So I think um, the primary um, objective of doing the 2022 review for the HNO and HRP is really to be able to pilot test the use of that cross-cutting review criteria that we did. So instead of asking um, the consultant to look at, uh, let's say, GBV risk mitigation, disability inclusion, or localization, um, we've done this quadrants in a way. Dennis, you're back. Would you like to pick up that point that instead of having all those cross-cutting concerns, we actually use like community engagement and accountability, risk analysis, Yeah, thanks and uh, apologies for my for my network. Um, yeah, so just a continuation to where uh, uh, Pamela was uh, that uh, when we looked at uh, the when we were doing the analysis, we 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 didn't just look at the different uh, you know the cross cutting elements, but we were able to analyze it from these four uh, quadrants. That is the risk analysis and risk response localization data and then uh, community engagement and accountability and when you look at the different uh, the different aspects when we are able to uh, address this then uh, our pre our presumption is that we will be able to uh, have children centered and their protection uh, also centered in our programming many thanks and uh, i'll hand it over back to joanna thanks fantastic thank you it takes a team sometimes to get through a presentation much appreciated all right, we have time for one or two final questions. If there is anything from those of you watching and listening, I haven't seen anything in the chat, but if you'd like to raise your hand or put something in the chat now. Maybe just to mention that uh, Pamela has shared the, the research. It's in the chat box. So anyone who'd like to read the full, the full report, uh, it's in the it's in our chat box. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks for that resource. Um, so we'll um, close down now. A big thank you to the many presenters. I think I counted eight presenters that we had. Um, the preparations, um, and hopefully this will give those of you who are watching the idea to maybe put together a submission um, for next year's alliance, uh, something you'd like to present on. But these folks have worked very hard uh, to bring all of their learning and their work from day to day into something that's shareable with you today. So a huge thank you to the many presenters we've had for your uh, presentation today and, of course, your ongoing work around centering children and their protection in all the humanitarian settings um, where you are uh, active. Mm -hmm.